times. But I want you to turn this morning, if you would please, to the book of Acts and chapter number 12. Acts and chapter number 12. While you're finding your place there, uh, let, let's think about this. Faith, one of those traits that we all claim to have, but yet the degree of our faith is probably less than we would want to admit. As we read uh, this first portion of Acts chapter 12 today, uh, you know, uh, uh, this text reveals reality really for a lot of us. And when I say us, I want you to understand something. I'm including myself in this realm. Uh, I've, I've, been, I've been preaching for a uh, good night, 46 years now. Been preaching. Been pastor of a church for over 40 years. Alright? And yet, I, I, I'm more firmly convinced the older I get that sometimes I, what I know I ought to do and what I know I ought to believe and the attitudes that I know that I ought to have, I find that many times I'm lacking in those areas. And, and we really need to stop and, and sometimes just step, step back a little bit and say, okay, now who's God in this situation? Am I God or is God God? And the truth of the matter is, until we realize that God is God, we're not going to re ever really see things develop the way that we would want to. You know, sometimes we might pray earnestly for God to move in a, in a, in a great way in our situation. But then we got to stop and ask ourselves, do we really expect God to do it? Or are we just saying prayers? You know, uh, the early church had a problem. Uh, they, they were prone to be unbelieving believers. But before we get too hard on their case, I want you to understand something. Sometimes we're awfully prone to be unbelieving believers as well. Amen? Either amen, oh me, whatever works. Amen? But the reality is that that's just the situation. So Acts chapter 12, uh, let's stand together and uh, we're going to read the text. And by the way, guys, I messed up on, on what I gave you. It should be 1 through 17, not just verse 7. Okay, I apologize for that. So Acts chapter 12, beginning with verse number 1. A little bit of a lengthy text, but stick with me. I want you to get the story here. The Bible says this, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivering him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church uh, unto God for him. For time's sake, we're going to stop with our text and we'll look at the rest of it as we go along. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this day. We pray, dear God, for the moving power of the Holy Spirit today in our midst. Oh, dear God, I need a special touch from you today. Dear God, I believe that every person here today in some way needs a special touch from God today. Lord, help us. We don't want to just come to church to experience a service and walk out feeling like we've done our duty for the week. Oh God, we need to hear from you. There's a world around us that needs to be impacted for the cause of Christ. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Help us, dear God, to have our eyes on you. And oh God, help us to truly... Lord, believe you and what you say and what you promise. And Lord, we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Acts chapter 12. Intriguing situation in the early church. Persecution had started. We see this in verses 1 through 5. James, the brother of John, had been killed uh, with the sword. To our knowledge, he is one of the martyrs of the church. 
Now, I realize that uh, at this particular time, there had probably been others uh, that also uh, had been uh, had been killed. Uh, I'm thinking back here, uh, uh, you know, uh, there uh, Paul had been there having many that were uh, put into prison and things along those lines. But uh, here we find that uh, James, the brother of John, had been killed. And so, therefore, when Herod saw that it pleased the Jews to do this, he said, well, uh, you know, since I'm on a popularity roll, let's keep on going going here. So he got a hold of Peter, put him in prison, and I believe that his intention was to put Peter to death as well. And by the way, once he got arrested, what did the church do? The very thing the church should have done. They got together and verse 5, it says, prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. They got together. They prayed. It was difficult times. It was dire circumstances. There were problems that were big. There were problems that were real. What is it that sometimes causes us to be unbelieving believers? What is it? And I got to looking at this text and, and, and praying over it, and I came to, I, I saw several things that just sort of, uh, just came to my mind here. First of all, I believe that we become unbelieving believers when we assume that the opposition is too formidable. We think what's against us is way too big for us to handle. Now let's just go ahead and get something in your mind. It is too big for you and me to handle. I'm going to tell you when I drive myself to insanity is when I try to fix everything on my own. That's when I, 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 I'm on the verge of cracking up. When I'm trying to solve everything. Sometimes things are too big for me. But I got some good news for you. It's not too big for God. But sometimes we become unbelieving believers because we assume that the opposition is just too formidable, too big. You know, here's an interesting thing. Satan has often used bluster to intimidate God's people. You know, I got to thinking back about this. What was it that was going on there in the camp of the children of Israel when they were there gathered against the Philistines and David was sent out there to take some food to his brothers and to the captain and he got out there and arrived just about the time that Goliath come walking out. And what did Goliath do? He started making all kinds of boasts and all kinds of threats and saying, Oh, send out a champion. I mean, if you can find one, send him out. And everybody Everybody was scared to death. You know what? David looked at him and says, that's just a big old boy with a lot of hot air. I mean, God can take him down. Now, nobody else saw that. They saw the size of that guy. And I've shared this before. He, he could have been as tall as 11 foot 6. That is a big guy. But it wasn't too big for God, was it? I think about during the days of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, Hezekiah, the king. Rabshakeh came up leading the forces of the Syrians and encamped all the way around Jerusalem. And he was there, uh, just crying out, uh, in the, in the Jews' own language saying, listen, I mean, your God can't deliver you. Look at all of the other gods that we've defeated and destroyed. Your God can't t- deliver you from us because we're too mighty and everybody inside was scared to death. And finally, uh, Hezekiah took the, the message that Rabshakeh had sent and and took it in and laid it before God and fell on his face and said, God, what are we going to do? And God said, I'm going to take care of this problem. It was too big for Hezekiah. It was too big for the children of Israel when Goliath came out. And here we find Herod. He kills James with the sword and has Peter in prison. By the way, it was too big for the early church. But the truth of the matter is, Satan uses bluster. You say, what what, what are you talking about? You know, a lot of times, you you ever ever seen this happen? 
And by the way, I'm not encouraging this by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you know, particularly since we're living in a totally crazy world today. Did you hear about the 14-year-old boy that got arrested this week? Because somebody dared him to kiss a 15-year-old girl. And he did, and they arrested him. And now he's going to be listed as a as as some type of a uh, you know someone that's guilty of a sex crime. We're living in a crazy world. You know, when I was a kid, if two boys decided they needed to settle something physically between the two of themselves, they just did it. And when you got home, your parents would say, "All right, what was it about? And did you win?" Now they want to go and find somebody and sue them. Have somebody thrown in jail. But do you ever notice how boys used to do it a long time ago? They'd get there and they'd get up against each other. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this. And, and the truth of the matter is nobody planned on doing anything. I remember one time a friend of mine and I, we, uh, his, his uncle got mad uh, because we were wrestling and I made him look bad. And so he came to me and he says, we got to fight after school. I said, Why? He said, well, my uncle caused a lot of trouble, so we got to have a fight. I said, you kidding? He said, no, I'm serious. So we went walking off after school trying to find a vacant lot somewhere where we could have a fight. And we got out there in the middle of that vacant lot and said, man, I don't want to fight you. He said, I don't want to fight you either, but my daddy will whip me if I don't. I said, okay, so we started fighting. I punched him a couple of times. He punched me a couple of times. And I said, hold on just a second. He said, what? I said, I don't want to fight you, and you don't want to fight me. You go home and tell your dad that you won, and I'll go home and tell my folks I won. Is that okay? He said, sounds good to me. We shook hands and went home. <laughs> you say, well, preacher, that wasn't being truthful. You're right, it wasn't. But, uh, you know, as a nine-year-old, I wasn't thinking about uh, matters of honesty at that particular moment. But most of it, <coughs> bluster, bluster, just, oh, I'm going to do this. And many times the devil comes along blowing hot air at us. And instead of us standing on the rock, standing on the Word of God, standing under the leadership of the Spirit of God, we hear the threats and the accusations of the enemy. And instead of standing where we ought to stand, we run and we cower because we assume the opposition is too formidable. Wow. And the enemy often appears to have the upper hand. Yes, no doubt. <coughs> but guess what? Victory is with the Lord. Luke chapter 21 says this, verse 25. It says, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then... Shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory? And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Whew. Yeah, we're facing some tough times. Yeah, we're facing some struggles. But, look up. Lift up your heads. Redemption draweth nigh. You know, when things appear hopeless... That is the most pressing time that we need serious prayer. You say, well, preacher, if it looks hopeless, it just looks hopeless to you and I. It doesn't look hopeless to an almighty God. So many times we're unbelieving believers because we assume the opposition is too formidable. Sometimes we assume the request is just too fantastic. Look down at verse number. It says, when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, uh, and, and, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel but thought he saw a vision and when they were past the first and the second ward they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city which opened to them of his own accord and they went out and passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him I mean Peter wasn't even sure this was real there he is sleeping in prison 
And, uh, and the angel has to hit him to wake him up. Tells him to get dressed and leads him on out. Everything is standing open. He comes to the iron gate. It swings open. And once he gets outside, the angel leaves. You know, sometimes whenever we pray, we, we don't really believe God because we think we're asking God something way too big. You know, we can find rest even in the midst of apparent hopelessness. I'm not going to take the time to read all of this, but in Daniel chapter 6, verse 16. If you don't remember what happened in Daniel chapter 6. The king had made a decree that no one was allowed to pray to any god except him for 30 days. And Daniel kept on praying as he always had. And those that were his enemies went in and said to the king, King, that guy, that Jew there, he's still praying to his God. Now you got to throw him in the den of the lions. That's what the law says. And the king did not want to do it, but the king had to do it because he had signed the law. And he brought Daniel in and he said, Daniel, the God you serve can deliver you. And now that's an interesting way of looking at it. Listen, God can deliver you and me. But I'm going to tell you something. I also like the attitude of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were facing the fiery furnace. They said, we believe that our God can deliver us, but even if He doesn't, King, we're not going to serve your gods. We'll die faithful before we'll compromise truth the king said God can now God can sometimes what the way God delivers doesn't really look like deliverance to us but it's still his deliverance but you know what there's one other sticky point in this God can deliver but we've got to be in the place where God can deliver us that means this, if we're running from God, it's awful hard for God. God's not going to force you and I to get in a position where we can find deliverance. He calls us. He woos us. He encourages us. But we've got the responsibility to be, to be obedient to Him. That's important to understand too. But sometimes we pray, but yet in our mind we think, oh, this, this thing that I'm praying for is just way too big. Listen, whenever we assume the request is too fantastic, I want you to understand something. That's when we are doubting the reality of God's answer. This is too big. God can't answer this. Is anything too hard for God? You know, we pray big prayers. But let's be honest. Too many times we only trust God for little answers. We pray big prayers, but trust God for little answers. Yet what does the Bible say? Jeremiah 33, 3. It says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You say, well, how come we don't see those great and mighty things? Because we don't always do the first part of the verse. The first part of the verse says, call unto me, and we don't. How can God answer until we call? How can He show us great and mighty things that are beyond our comprehension when we're not even willing to do the first part and say, God, help. I need you. Sometimes we're unbelieving believers because we assume the request is too fantastic. Sometimes we're unbelieving believers because we assume God's power is just too unexpected. You know, verse 11 of the text, it says this, And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. 
But they said unto her, Thou art mad. In other words, you're crazy. You're nuts. Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then, they, then said they, it is, is, it is his angel. You say, what does that mean? That means, <laughs> I guess their theology wasn't quite developed yet. They said, well, he's dead. And that's his spirit. You know, they said, you know, we, sometimes we just don't really expect God's power to be revealed. You know, too many times I think we only accept God's power after He reveals Himself. And by the way, I'm not saying this is an easy concept. Lord knows, I'm preaching to me just as much or more so than I'm preaching to you. But so many times, we need to be there expecting God to do something instead of just hoping He might do something. And only recognizing the power of God after He's revealed Himself. Instead, we ought to be saying, okay, God, how are you going to handle this? What are you going to do in this situation to make things right? You know, we pray. But how many times do we really expect to get the answer we desire? Or do we expect less? Matthew 17 and verse number 19 we find this, it says, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, uh, but by prayer and fasting. He said, Listen, the thing that gets you is unbelief. But sometimes it's necessary to pray and fast. Boy, that's something Americans don't like to even think about. I mean, sacrifice. Sacrifice our own comfort for the purpose of getting an answer from God. But we need to do that. We pray, but do we really expect it? And we make provisions for lesser answers before trusting God out of our heart. I mean, what, what were the, I mean, Peter comes and starts knocking on the door. And Rhoda, I mean, they were afraid because Christians were beginning to be persecuted. And she comes and says, who's there? And he says, Peter! Peter who? <laughs> Man, I'm Peter! I'm the Apostle Peter! Oh! She takes off running inside, leaves him locked outside. He said, boy, this is a fine how to do. She's running in there, oh, Peter's at the door, Peter's at the door, he's there, oh, I heard him, and I know it's him. They said, what are you talking about? Peter, he's at the door. Well, girl, you're crazy. Peter's in prison. Oh, but listen, I know it was him. I recognize his voice. They said, oh, he's died, and his spirit's come to visit us. He really didn't expect God's power. Now, before we get hard on them, let's be honest. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. And we assume that the answer is just too unbelievable. Look at verses 16 and 17. It says, But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And he and unto them with the hand to hold their peace declared unto him unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and he said go show these things unto James and to the brethren and he departed and went into another place they were astonished assuming that the answer is just too unbelievable you know what's the problem what's the problem I think the problem is this and I had to spend a lot of time dealing with my own heart on this. We forget that our weapons are mighty and not carnal. Uh, by the way, I have never seen this entire movie. I can't tell you if it's good, bad, or indifferent. It was put out by Hollywood, so it's probably more on the bad side than the good side. But I've seen one clip over and over. And I think it's really funny. This one clip. This is all I've seen of the movie. The movie was Crocodile Dundee. 
Now, some of y'all laughing lets me know that you've seen the movie. And I guess he's in New York City or some other big city, and somebody comes up to, to, uh, to mug him and pulls out a knife. And he says, oh, now this is a knife. You know, the devil comes up trying to threaten us. Okay, here's, here is my big knife. I mean, isn't that frightening? I'll tell you what. I, you know what? If I stabbed you, I'm not even sure I'd hit a vital organ. Okay? <laughs> That's not much of a knife. Not much of a knife. We, we try to go out and fight nuclear warfare with weapons like this. And the problem is, this is not the way God wants us to fight. He wants us to use His weapons. What does the Bible say? The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Wow. And we also forget this. We forget that nothing is too hard for God. You may think your situation is hopeless. I might think that your situation is hopeless. I might think that my situation at times is hopeless. But I want to remind you, if God is true and the Bible is true, and by the way, God is true and the Bible is true, then nothing, nothing is too hard for God. Jeremiah 32, 17, it says this, Ah, Lord God, behold, Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by Thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for Thee. The God who can speak the universe into existence can certainly handle our little mundane problems if we just cast our eyes on Him. You see, any time we assume the answer is too unbelievable, we are forgetting that God does the unbelievable. And, and why does God do the unbelievable? God does the unbelievable so that He alone is glorified. You see, if I fix the problem, then I can take the vows. If you fix the problem, then you can take the vows. But if God steps in and God fixes it, then God and God alone gets the glory. I'm going I'm to tell you the, the truth. Every one of us. You get in a time of difficulty and, and stress, you're going to call out to God. You're going to do it. When Madeline Murray O'Hare's husband was dying, and he knew it, here's a guy that was a, a self-avowed atheist that he and Madeline Murray O'Hare had actually started a, a quote-unquote atheist church. And yet when he was dying, he was calling out. He says, somebody get me a preacher, get me a priest, get me somebody that can tell me about God. Huh. The great atheist. When Voltaire, the great infidel, lay dying, his final words was, Oh dear God, I feel the fires of hell already. That should be a testimonial. Everybody's going to pray. But what's our real expectation? You know, prayer is not just our means of pleading for help. But it needs to be our constant source of communion with an almighty God. You know, here's where I, when I watched the movie and then gave it further consideration in prayer during the week. We need to get to the point where we can pray with such intimacy and such passion that we can lay it before God 
and trust God for the outcome. You say, well, that's so simple. Yeah. But why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? I think the reason is sometimes we're unbelieving believers. We know it here, but not here. We know it here, but it doesn't translate to our walk. We know it here, but it doesn't reveal itself in our actions. God help us. We've got a mighty God. Let's live like it. Let's pray like it. Let's believe like it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Thank you for your attention. Examine your own heart and life. Let me ask you this question first of all. Do you really know Jesus as your Savior? I'm not saying did you at some point just recite a prayer. I'm not against praying to trust Christ as Savior. Don't misunderstand me. But do you really know Him? Did you really trust Him? Is He real? If you're not 100% sure, we'd love to help you with that. And then if you're here today and maybe maybe you, you just... You've been through a tough time. God knows your heart better than you know your heart. Let's just trust God. Let's realize we've got a God... That nothing is too hard for him if we'll just trust him. Let's pray like believers. Heavenly Father, do something special, Lord, in all of our hearts and lives today. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. What if I could tell you that I could share with you the best news imaginable? I'm sure that'd be a refreshing thought when we consider that normally what we hear on television and the radio today is nothing but bad news. What if I could share with you the fact that we could spend eternity in a perfect place where everything is joyful and there's no more sin or death or suffering? Of course, the Bible tells us that place is called heaven. Now, there are many religions that all have different ways to tell you how they perceive that you could get to heaven. Most religions say, do this, do that, do the other. And if you do enough of the good stuff, then you just might make it. I'm glad that there's a better way than what religion says. The Bible tells us that God loves us. In fact, in John 3:16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, the fact of the matter is we could never do enough on our own to be acceptable to God because we're sinners, we're fallen, and God knows that. And that's why Jesus came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood. But that's not the end of the story. When they put his body in the grave, three days and three nights later, the Bible says that he rose again. He conquered death, and today he's seated at the right hand of the Father to be our Savior, to be our High Priest, to be the mediator between us and a holy and righteous God. Now, for us to have the right relationship with Him, it's not that we have to do things to earn His favor. He's already done all that is necessary. He came, He died, He paid for our sins. The only thing that He requires is that we accept Him as our Savior. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then to be able to accept this great salvation, the Bible says very simply, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dear friend, salvation is as simple as us accepting by faith what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary and then calling out by faith to him and accepting that wonderful gift of salvation. The greatest decision you'll ever make is to trust Christ as Savior. 
And I'd like to encourage you to trust Christ today as your Savior. And then you can go to Him in prayer, and you can pray something like this and say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you died for me on the cross. And right now, right here, I accept you as my Savior. Please save me, and I thank you for your promise to do so. And you can pray that in Jesus' name, and you can have the best news ever that you've got a home waiting for you in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.